Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode number 67 for April 22nd, 2010. Giant Cup of Happiness. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by the new Carbonite Pro. It's simple, secure, and affordable online backup for your small business. For a free trial and to learn more, visit CarbonitePro.com. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware. This is uh, episode number 67. I'm Ryan Schrout, joined by Colleen Kelly, as well as Patrick Norton this week. <laughs> Welcome, Patrick. It's How's good it going, man? Show. Doing pretty well, doing pretty well. How long has uh, it been Patrick since you were on air with Patrick Norton? Uh, it has probably been six or seven years. Wow. Back, uh, I, I was actually in San Francisco on the screensavers a couple of times with he and Leo uh, talking about AMD motherboards at the time. <laughs> that would have been, yeah, that would have been at least six years ago. Yep. Oh yeah, it goodness. has been a while. But we're excited we bought, brought Patrick in to give us uh, some, some additional outside perspective in the world of hardware. And we figured <laughs> who knows how to break stuff and take things apart much better than Patrick, not very many people. So, At least the breaking stuff I'm really good at. <laughs> you only have to try to put it back together. If you, if, as long as you break it correctly, you, know, you can always just try to put it back together. If you're successful, that's not what you're judged on. So, um, what the scotch tape is for. <laughs> yes, exactly. Scotch and duct, all that good stuff. It's amazing what you can do with a heat gun, heat glue gun. You know, and the first topic we're going to talk about this week kind of goes right down that route. Uh, this was something that came up because of Patrick's kind of experiences, I guess, in the last couple of weeks. We were going to talk about some of the more creative and out there overclocking methods that maybe some of our listeners or viewers have never even heard of, let alone tried. And that is getting into the world of kind of like li not just liquid cooling, so water cooling that's tame compared to what we're going to talk about here. How about dry ice cooling, liquid nitrogen, liquid <laughs> helium, that kind of stuff? Well, should, should we start out with the, the, the HWBOT, the world records? The, should we kind of start with sort of the... Because the, what we're talking about here is basically Put drag racing. Yeah, yes. I mean, it's, it's, you know, this is something like you do when you want to try to throttle a processor up really, really high for a really, really short It's not a daily driver. Oh, no. You know. <laughs> yeah, it could be if you have a really interesting concept of drivability, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, what what are the what are the records up to now for some of the overclocking? So I checked right before we went on air here, and the current world record for CPU Z, which is the application where when you boot up, you have that set your start, and it'll just tell you what frequency your CPU is running at. The current world record is eight point no, let's see, eight thousand one hundred ninety nine gigahertz. On a Core uh, i7? No, or? no, no. This, this is okay. on, an, on an LGA 775 Celeron processor. <laughs> I Celeron? Uh, because those are just happen to be the CPUs that clock the best. Actually, if you look at the world records list, a lot of them are, you know, socket 775 Celeron processors and even some Pentium 4s up there that just were built in a way that People were able to get higher and higher clock speeds. Obviously, the highest clock speed doesn't necessarily equate to the best performance. But it equates <sighs> to the biggest bragging rights. On, the, on that particular test, right. So, I mean, <laughs> like Patrick was mentioning, if you go to, the, is it hwbot.org or dot, yeah, yeah hwbot.org. <laughs> I mean, they list benchmarks uh, from SuperPi, 3D Mark 2001, uh, 3D Mark 06, 3D Mark Vantage, PC Mark Vantage. All these benchmarks have their separate world records. And CPU Z just happens, happens to be one of them. It's just the highest clocked processor. But you can also go there, and if you want to see what's the highest clocked Core i7 processor on an X58 motherboard, and I think that's going to be somewhere around 6.5 to 6.6 .6 gigahertz. <laughs> Which is good. Well, when you're talking about like a 2.8, you know, gigahertz part, is pretty insane. Um. Yeah, <laughs> that's more than double the frequency of, you know, the the most expensive standard clock speed processors that you can buy today from Intel. I think the Core i7-980X is like a 3.33 gigahertz part. So you're essentially doubling 
the frequency of that of that part using uh, fancy things like liquid nitrogen and dry ice <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. When the phase changes from liquid to uh, gas, it's it very cold. Yes, and liquid yes. nitrogen gets even colder. Um, yeah, it's 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 to we we're playing around with uh, CO two and uh, decided to play around with dry ice. And I, I normally use basically it's like a cup, right? There's a big, huge block of copper or something really conductive, and and a cup comes out of it. Um, Coolance actually has a pretty crazy uh, what do they call it? The DIY liquid nitrogen evaporator chamber, the CPU LN two V two. It's a big metal kinda, cup that bolts to your motherboard on top of your processor <laughs> yeah well it, and, it, and it's got if you know if you go into the close-up on the right there it's got this weird screen in the bottom of it bottom of it and what people do is they use um, like 90 percent alcohol because if there's any more um, water in the alcohol it'll actually freeze when the dry ice hits it or acetone mm -hmm. which is really a charming substance to have inside the house and they break up the dry ice into like pea-sized chunks and they they basically you know put the acetone or the or the uh, i'm sitting here looking at the cooler over there they put the acetone Tone or the the alcohol inside of there, they drop the um, dry ice into it, and then the liquid gets super cooled. That cools down the block. The block has a it's you know it's a big chunk of metal, so it's got a fair amount of thermal mass and draws the heat out of the processor. Um, what I was doing was taking an old Zalman cooler and packing dry ice into it, and it was really funny because <laughs> we're getting the when you're looking we're at talking like, about an air cooler here, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, it was I didn't have a we used to have a a uh, copper plate with a piece of copper tubing um, brazed onto it that works pretty well for this. Um, not as you know, fancy as the Coolants, but but it does the trick, and it's it's gone. Nobody knows where it is. So I ended up playing around with chunks of dry ice, because I figured the dry ice will cool the, the cooler, and then the cooler will cool the CPU. And the numbers were miserable, and I finally figured out that I wasn't stacking the dry ice evenly on the actual device itself. So on one side, it was when I basically pulled an infrared thermometer and one side it was reading like negative eight degrees Celsius. And at the other side of the, the plate, the cold plate, it was reading like 40 degrees Celsius. So mm. I, I re, kind of rearranged how I was doing everything and actually got the temperatures down below uh, zero degrees center, centigrade on one side. So I was pretty, pretty stoked about that. But there wasn't enough thermal mass in the device to really transfer a whole lot of heat. It was fine at idling, but as soon as you started running um, like a torture test, uh, everything kind of heated up pretty fast to 60 or 80 degrees, which kind of defeats the purpose. <laughs> but you were getting condensation from it, meaning the, the liquid vapor of water in the outside air was actually turning to liquid on top of your motherboard, right? Well, it was more frost than liquid. <laughs> <laughs> but frost is conductive, right? Well, you know, the, it was it was kind of funny because the radiator fans on the Zalman were getting frost. I mean, normally, right, what you do is basically take pipe insulation or some type of foam insulation, or if you're really unhinged, you take, like, you ever see the spray foam in a can you used to, like, fill mouse holes and stuff or just, you know, fill insulation? Yeah. Um, or if you you're know. on Junkyard Wars to guarantee buoyancy in your all-terrain vehicle. <laughs> or hopefully guarantee buoyancy if you've done the math right. But, <laughs> <Tempted>. yeah. <laughs> the, uh, but you can actually, like, you know, the idea, right, is you, you, you know, you, you secure your giant cup of happiness on top of your processor. And you By the way, that's the title of the show right now. Cup of happiness. A giant cup of happiness. <laughs> I like that thought. You know, you spray your foam around that, right? And that, that helps eliminate the condensation issues. Um, I wasn't planning on doing this. I wasn't going to be doing this for a particularly long time. So I knew I could basically lift the CPU cooler out um, before it started uh, uh, defrosting and dripping down onto things. Right. Um, you know, plus, you know, uh, I, I, at this point, you know, I had a number of motherboards on this system die because of manufacturer problems, not my own problems. So I'm a little cavalier about motherboard lifespan on Core i7s <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, and, and the truth is, is when you get into these types of overclocking, you have to go in assuming that there's a very, very, very good risk of you breaking any parts that you have hooked up to this system, the processor, the motherboard, the power supply. All of those are, they need to be expendable parts, or you need to be willing to purchase new ones should you need to get a system back it's up. It's like and running. drag racing. It is. It, 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 it is. really, it really is. Now. No, when you, like, when you see them at the end, of, like, like there's this four-second run, and all of a sudden you see them tearing the entire engine apart, swapping on new heads, and it's not yeah, quite I, that uh, bad. 
I co-drive an autocross car, which is a uh, Carmen Ghia that's built up to like 3.2 liters of air-cooled, turbocharged, four-cylinder ridiculousness. And it's not designed to be a daily driver on the street because, A, with the gearing in it now, you can't really go above 35 miles an hour or so. <laughs> Actually, no, it's faster than that. Maybe it's 65. <laughs> but it also can't survive um, being on for more than like 15, 20 minutes. But that's okay because the course is shorter than that. Yeah, the course is like two minutes, right? <laughs> So, Ryan, you saw uh, you saw people playing around with liquid nitrogen recently. Yeah, so I have to say, I've never actually done the hand. I've done hands on with it, but never like in my own personal, you know, labs or anything like that. And never. you call yourself a hardware dork? Yeah, no, no I kidding. actually call that smart. <laughs> LN two is not only is it kind of dangerous; it's also pretty expensive to buy. Um, but when you can get a hold of it, well, yeah, I, when I was at a couple of weeks ago or last weekend, I was at an Asus event in Santa Clara, and they were. Demonstrate. They were trying to show off their motherboards and how how good they were for overclocking. What better way? What better way to do that than get nine liquid nitrogen overclockers all banging on your motherboard at the same time? And I had to say, I don't think we had a single actual motherboard die on us. But they were all using liquid nitrogen. I think Asus had 480 liters on hand or something like that. Two huge vats of this stuff. Uh, it was pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And everybody, you know, all these guys, they had, I mean, it's a completely different culture of hardware. If you, if you are a hardware enthusiast and you listen to this show, this is a totally different class. And if you're in that other class, you understand what, what it is. Because, I mean, you know, they have custom, uh, custom made. Some of these guys have, if you're, you know, kind of the celebrity LN2 overclocker, maybe you have some like of the records. Like Sammy and, or someone like that. Yeah, Sammy, uh, Fugger, those guys from Extreme Systems are well known for that. And they actually go around at expos and are paid by motherboard manufacturers to sit there and overclock and you know demo stuff but they have their own kind of branded ln2 pots with you know different etchings on the bottom that they think somehow increase you know the thermal properties here um and what was interesting you were talking about using that like spray foam to kind of insulate the motherboard they were very 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 particular about insulating it because they're talking about temperatures uh, of almost minus 200 c using yeah. this liquid nitrogen so a lot more probability of uh condensation and, and frost and that kind of stuff on the rest of the components, which obviously you don't want. And one of the, one of the teams actually took standard Vaseline, rubbed it all over the motherboard, inside the pins, inside the PCI Express slots, everything they could, and they run a heat gun over it so it kind of melts into the pores of everything. You. <laughs> Probably yeah, you don't do that to your computer? You. <laughs> <laughs> no. It I was thought everyone did that. Apparently, but uh, not very fun in, in my view and a lot of guys actually a lot of the other guys were using standard art that they would kind of knead in their fingers and then push down on different board and they basically would have the entire motherboard covered in this eraser except for the you know the processor socket the memory sockets and those places that need it all in an effort to prevent condensation the um it was, it was i mean it was interesting to watch i mean it's one of those things where you're only running that system for a few minutes at a time at most in order to get that benchmark run done because you have to basically stand there and babysit the whole system constantly dipping a little bit of liquid nitrogen in there a little bit more you know trying to keep the temperatures at a level that you want yeah usually um, you're not playing the game while you're doing this because <laughs> no. your hands are a little busy pouring Yes, unless you have a good friend there who's sitting there pulling liquid nitrogen while you're playing. Patrick, will you be his good friend? <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's an expensive way to play uh, uh, Modern Warfare 2 or something like that. I would just get the air cooler. But it, one of the interesting things about it was, I don't know if you've heard about something called a cold bug before. The, <laughs> I actually, I, I think I ran into the cold bug last week. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, what, what CPU were you using? Was it the... Um, you're using Core, a Core i7 920. Okay. Those still have cold bugs. Although I was talking with somebody today at Intel, they kind of hate the term cold bug because that insinuates that it's some kind of, you know, Fault. manufacturing problem or something like that. So a cold bug is a, a problem where the processor ceases to function below a certain temperature. AMD actually got, apparently they quote, fix the cold bug on their processors with the Phenom 2s. That's why uh, last year, I think at CES, they were actually demonstrating the Phenom 2 processors being overclocked on liquid helium, which I think wow. goes down to like minus 300 C, yeah. something like that, something something ridiculous like that. Um, yeah, but that's only what, you know, the amateurs use. <laughs> Frankly, the vacuum of space is what you want. 
<laughs> right, Actually, exactly. All, but, um, do uh, do we know cold? anything from a from a chemistry standpoint that could be more ridiculously thermally efficient at cooling than liquid helium? We just can't obtain it because it's too expensive. Probably, definitely, too. It's, it's got to be too expensive. Um, they, we were talking about. But I'm curious what's next. I mean, if there's any chemists in the audience, would you please send me an email and right. explain I think to me where I could steal some? Liquid helium three is Those the coldest. Are variances uh, of that? Like 452 degrees below Fahrenheit, maybe? Yeah, actually, actually, I did see. Um, All right, hold on. I, Who's got an iPhone near their, um, near their microphone? I don't have an iPhone. I have a, I have a Palm Pre. <laughs> Not I'm keeping me. the camera on the it, guy with the It iPhone. should be in, in travel mode. <laughs> okay, because I just... Um, but actually, the, there was a, a research group that I think they clocked some processor, not a retail, not a CPU that we've actually gotten a hold of, up to like 500 or 600 gigahertz, and they were using liquid helium to get that. And I, I'm trying to remember what they were at Kelvin. And that's different than helium-3, so we just need to yeah. get our hands on the... Helium-3 is a light, non-radioactive isotope of helium with two protons and one neutron. So, homework, boys. <laughs> Find a, a liquid If you want to impress three. the ladies, yeah. show up to the overclocking <laughs> event with stuff that only NASA has. Yeah, um, I don't think NASA has the budget for this right now. Not anymore. Budget for anything? <laughs> <laughs> we can get a, a moment of silence for NASA's there. budget <laughs> in space exploration. In the future of the, humanity, maybe. Um, what, what's interesting about that cold bug I was mentioning before is the, the, the cold bug that happens on the Intel processors that, that Patrick thinks he hit is somewhere in like the minus 120, 130 C range, I think. <laughs> and what they're saying is essentially what happens to the, the, semi, the transistors cease to function. Part of the chemistry of the transistor can't function anymore below that temperature. <laughs> So, uh, and, and that's, that's obviously a problem. The system won't boot. Hold on, and that what, means you won. You win? You win. <laughs> if you get it cold enough? You've, you've well, now beat the game. I, wait, no, because the game is to actually make the, the CPU run. I mean, actually, I should point out that I had a, a basically a glove on and a piece of dry ice in my hand. Did and, you have a falconer's glove? Uh, no, I had a welding glove and basically molded it till it, you know, let it melt until it actually fit mm. the processor. Because, you know... Um, it does whatever you call that change from from solid to uh, gaseous. Evaporation. And, uh, I'm sorry. Evaporation. No, I actually was lectured recently that it's it's not evaporating. Um, there's a chemistry term that I, I probably missed along we with most. We should get a chemist the, on the show. We've got <laughs> lots of answers on how to be more stupid that we need. The uh, but it actually basically the, with the uh, with the CO2, which is like negative 109 degrees. The the uh, sublimation. Thank you. The uh, with it, the the dry ice direct the frozen dry ice the dry ice directly down on there actually prevented the refused to boot so prevented to uh, prevented it from booting. But it, uh, it wasn't permanently destroyed. No, no, system's running great. <laughs> yeah, once once it warms back up, it's all it's all fine. The problem for these uh, these liquid nitrogen overclockers and all these other types of extreme overclocking is that what happens is while the processor is running, you know, they're pouring a little bit of LN2 and they're trying to keep this temperature right around, you know, maybe minus 110. But when they right. go to reboot, when the system goes to idle, it, 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 it quickly will lower, um, will lower the temperature even further because it's not doing any work. So right. if it jumps from 110 to 130, all of a sudden the system won't reboot and they have to wait for the, for this, <laughs> for the processor to warm up. Over, you know, you'll say 100C before it'll turn on, right? So, And sometimes you'll just get this huge mass of, con of condensed ice around your pot that becomes, you know, almost unwieldy. And you have to, you know, either switch pots or take some time to de-ice it. Yeah, these guys had really nice heat guns and they were using, uh, like, small welding torches, essentially, to keep, you know, at between runs they were heating up the uh, the LN2 pots in a way to, to kind of prevent that type of stuff and they they were telling me it actually would make the connection between the processor and the pot a little bit better when they you know heat it up to 300 Fahrenheit and then cool it back down to minus you know 150 C or whatever it was I mean this type of stuff is just kind of really awesome. beyond us <laughs> but it is but it was I mean you know Ken my, our, our, our video editor was there with us and he just kept, I mean, both of us just kept watching this stuff and you're like, all you're doing is you're watching somebody pour liquid into a pot. Right. But it's just so, 
It's just so cool. But the thing is, it's when you understand what's going on that you find it impressive. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of things like that, like golf and football. I have no idea what's going on in football, so I have zero interest. But people who know what's going on find it slightly interesting. Yeah. Well, there is the advantage of the giant smoky mayhem in the middle of a computer for the overclockers. <laughs> it's yeah. it, it's kind of like drifting. It's not really all that effective of a sport, um, but when you look at it from a spectator perspective, it's the one that draws the crowd because there's lots of smoke everywhere and noise. Yeah, and actually, I have one more thing. One other one uh, to mention is sublim or not. I was going to say sublimation again. Submersion, where you actually put you submerge all of the components of of the motherboard. In a liquid, uh, some people, if you use like really, 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 if you have to use uh, really, really pure, looks a lot better. I mean, yeah, fluorinor you can get, but you have to have a permit to buy it. Apparently, and if you get it too cold, it turns into a gel. Uh, you have to get it really. I've, Yoshi and I back on the screensavers. Uh, uh, What's that show? Screensavers uh, back in the day what was had it? Uh, five or eight gallons of fluorinor that we were given uh, uh, given use of. It's also it's insanely expensive. Um, yes, but. Uh, it's it's pretty amazing. <laughs> That's what Cray supercomputers used for some time. You yeah. can actually, yeah, it, they did. You can use mineral oil. The the risk is that if there's any kind of uh, particulates in it, if it's not really, really, really pure mineral oil, it could all the all of a sudden become electrically conductive. Which, uh, as you might guess, with a motherboard in a liquid that is conductive, would be a problem. Hey Patrick, so. do you think we could get Yoshi on sometime? Uh, I, I have no idea. Um, Let's try to track I, I'd him. have to ask him. So he's he's between being a father and and uh, working full time at a pretty intense gig down in L.A. He's usually pretty busy, but certainly pass the word along. Maybe cool. he has some time to be uh, ridiculous on air <laughs> twice a month. All right. Now, uh, before we move on, and we're going to talk a little bit with Patrick about uh, the new MacBooks. Uh, I know Colleen wanted to talk about the ability or its inability for the 13 inch to get uh, the full upgrade that we saw the 15 and 17 inch models get. But before we get to that, I want to take a quick minute here to thank today's sponsor. That would be uh, Carbonite Pro. Actually, you've probably heard me talk about Carbonite on this show before. It's a service that will help you back up your PC or your Mac files all remotely, all off site. Um, it, the, the original service was developed for individuals, but if you are part of a small business, and apparently there are 100,000 of you out there that are, uh, then you can use this new service to back up your computers. Uh, it's a backup service uh, called Carbonite Pro. backs up all the PCs in the business automatically whenever they are connected to the Internet. It's uh, easy to use. You don't need to have any extra hardware. You don't need to be a, a technical person in order to set it up. And, and so Carbonite Pro will give either you or your administrator, depending on how small of a company you actually are, a centralized dashboard or you can get, you know, backup status, summaries of all the different computers on the network and that kind of stuff. And if there's ever a data loss, each employee can access their own backup files or you can access them and, and, and remotely restore all these files as well. So uh, you can get your office back up and running again without a lot of headaches or lost time. Uh, the files are encrypted uh, using SSL, so they should be safe off-site. No problems there, even during the transmission process. Uh, it's pretty affordable. Prices starting as low as $10 per month, depending on how much capacity you need. That shouldn't be a problem. I think one of the examples they give you here is if you have 18 computers that are using 5 gigs of backup each, it's about $50 a month that's it? for that backup. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's pretty impressive. It, the, the, apparently, the price doesn't change based on how many computers you have at all, just about what your total backup capacity is going to be. Um, you can try Carbonite Pro completely free for 30 days. All you have to do is go to this new URL, CarbonitePro.com. No promo code, no anything like that. Just go to CarbonitePro.com and give it a shot. We thank them for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Now, we want to talk about MacBooks here. <laughs> Colleen had a specific request to talk about the 13-inch MacBook. We kind of talked about the MacBooks last week. Uh, the 13-inch stayed with the Core 2 processor, had a slightly upgraded NVIDIA integrated graphics chipset. And then the 15 and 17-inch models got upgraded to Core i5, Core i7, Arendelle-based systems that have a discrete NVIDIA GPU in addition to the integrated GPU with... Uh, that comes on the Arendelle processor. So what was it that 
you saw, Colleen, that kind of piqued your interest here on this 13-inch? Well, one of the things I've always really liked about the unibody MacBooks, as they call them, which is a completely silly misnomer. It's really just that they're milled aluminum rather than being stamped and, you know, fabricated in a different way, is that their motherboards have always been kind of impressive as far as how little they get with how much functionality is on it. So if you look at on our, the Ars Technica article that we'll put in the show notes, you can mm -hmm. see the 17-inch uh, and the 15-inch MacBook internals, and you can also see that they've distinctly got three very large substrates for um, microprocessors. But if you look up at the 13-inch model, it's even smaller, and there's almost no room at all. <laughs> um, so it seems like the issue was probably because of the whole debate uh, between NVIDIA chipsets and um, uh, Intel's integrating them on the chip and all that kind of fun stuff that there's just simply no room in their design, in their body, to actually fit all the uh, parts to put a Core i5 in a discrete NVIDIA GPU in. And then they made the, the decision that it was more important to have an NVIDIA GPU and a Core 2 processor than it was to um, get a Core i5 and an integrated graphics chip. Yeah, that's fair. That's pretty much accurate. So <laughs> the, the 15 and 17 inch motherboards, you can see there are three chip solution. You've got the processor, you've got the chipset, the Intel branded chipset that has your, your SATA, your uh, USB, firewire connectivity, all that kind of stuff. And then you've got the discrete NVIDIA graphics card the, or G, the chip, the discrete NVIDIA graphics chips. You've got three separate chips on there that obviously all take up space on the PCB of the motherboard. Apparently now with 13 inch, they didn't have enough room. So... I mean, if you look at the picture, you, there's no way you could even physically fit it on there, let alone add the circuitry right. to support it. Um, I, I wish at, I had some sense of scale of how that, how, what the size of that motherboard was compared to the size of the, of the system itself. Well, you, you can know. see the ports on the side. So these two things mm -hmm. here are USB ports, and that's a, uh, yeah. that's a network port. Yeah, so I guess it's just fan and battery or what take up the rest of the space inside there. Oh, so, yeah, the, and you mean inside of the case relative. Yeah, yeah. They, they, you're going to have the uh, lithium polymer battery pack, and you're going to have the um, uh, optical drive. Right. What's interesting here is that I don't think Apple really had a choice in this matter because it's not that they made the decision that, that the NVIDIA discrete GPU, uh, the, the NVIDIA integrated GPU in the Mac 13 inch was somehow more important than moving to the Core i5 i7 Arendelle platform. I completely Arendelle disagree platform. with you on that because Steve Jobs actually um, responded to someone via email and said And you believe that, Steve Jobs? What you say? <laughs> well, no, no. It's one of those... The, 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 the truth of the matter is they made a commitment with Snow Leopard to OpenCL and GPU-based GPU computing. Right. If they went with, if they only had two chips, they only had space for two chips, if they went with the Core i5 and i7, they had to include the, or the Intel you know, IO hub chipset as well then the integrated graphics on that part does not support OpenCL. Right, and so the quote from Steve use. Jobs via email, assuming this is really Steve Jobs, but lots of outlets seem to agree that it is, says we chose killer it. graphics plus 10-hour battery life over a very small CPU speed increase. Users will see far more performance boost from speed <laughs> graphics, which is precisely, precisely what you were just saying. Um, I, yeah, kind I guess. Of. Kind, of. <laughs> kind of. I mean, they're not going to see speedy, most people aren't going to see any kind of performance benefits from it, really, right. in, in, in the type of computing they're doing on a 13-inch MacBook Pro. It was more of one of those things where, look, they put their foot in the ground, they're going to do OpenCL, they made Snow Leopard, bam, they were going to do GPU-based computing. For them to go back and, and have a system now that does not support it with the Pro moniker on it just wasn't a possibility at this point. Right. So... And given the constraints of the fact that there's no longer the ability to make a two-chip solution for yes. a Core well, i5 there, or Core there, there, You can do a two-chip solution if you want to work with Intel HD graphics, which is, you know, it, it's a mediocre graphics right, platform. Right, but if they want to, to do what's an available. NVIDIA discrete GPU, mm -hmm. 
there's not enough physical space on the board. Part be, of the reason the there's not enough physical space is because Intel's not letting NVIDIA and other chipset designers exactly. make chipsets that are compatible with any Intel processor that integrates the memory, uh, or basically has the memory controller integrated with the, uh, basically integrated on the on the CPU. Right. So there's like, you know what I mean? There's they basically had a choice between making a Core i3 and having Intel HD graphics, which weren't bad, uh, at least until you plug them into a 24-inch monitor or want to take advantage of... Until you try to do anything in 3D. Well, I mean, these aren't gaming machines, right? I think MacBook it's more of an Pro? issue with... Let me, let me finish what I'm saying. You know, one of the things people want the discrete chipsets for is so they can take advantage of acceleration, like CUDA acceleration and stuff like that. That speeds up in codes and 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 processing on multimedia. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, you definitely want discrete graphics for gaming, but I don't think a lot of people are are going like, I'm going to get a freaking MacBook Pro because I'm going to kick ass on video games. It's like, come on, you know. No, I I'll agree on. with you on that, but there's a lot of situations like you're saying where the GPU is absolutely important to MacBook Pro user. Mm hmm. And so, which is why they had, you know, why they basically went with a Core Two Duo instead of going with a Core i three, because the Core i three would have forced them into because of the physical restraints of the space inside of a thirteen inch MacBook. I mean, they could have made it fit if they just, you know, put a two and a half inch bezel around a thirteen inch monitor. Right. They would well, have had enough room on the, the motherboard to use the exactly. <laughs> use a Core i five or a Core i three. There's also the pricing, because basically mm -hmm. the the general consensus is that 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 Apple got a fire sale deal on the Core 2 Duos because Intel basically wants to shovel, you know, Intel's deal is like, hey, yeah, we'll make sure you've got enough Core 2 Duos to do these 13-inch Mac, MacBooks, but, you know, generally speaking, Intel's goal is to empty their, their channel of all of the Core 2 Duo parts as quickly as possible because they want to move on to the next and, and more profitable chip. And so, this, this is really, I think, one of, it's, this is the second instance of how Intel's kind of monopolistic tendencies are really hurting the consumer. Because had NVIDIA been allowed to make a chipset for Core i5, Core i7 processors, right. then they would have been able to integrate graphics and all the I.O., SATA, FireWire, USB into a single chip. And we would have had, you know, you could have had that capability in your Core i, your, or your 13-inch MacBook Pro. You could have had a smaller 15-inch, you know, or something like that. You know, th this, is, this is one of the first kind of definitive reasons where we can say, look, see, this is, this is an instance where an NVIDIA or an ATI option, although that would have been a little weird, <laughs> would have made a difference. And because Intel used legal right. issues to push NVIDIA out of the chipset market, this is what you're left with. Now, how would you feel about um, <coughs> what the chat room just said and what, I've, what I would have done, which is if you look at the innards, they've got the optical drive, the hard drive, the battery, and the logic board. Well, what if you drop the optical drive? Well, then you have to completely redesign the motherboard. You have to completely re-architect the motherboard, and you end up dropping the optical drive. And, and based on the reception of the MacBook Air, the typical Apple notebook purchaser yeah. gets really whiny when they lose their optical drive if they're paying. Then you get a netbook. <laughs> Nothing but, wrong with netbooks. But what's I your like trade-off? I netbook. I, I, for one... <laughs> think that optical drives are a waste of space inside of all of my computers and I would but have you preferred... are super geek you are she yeah. you have bolted together three gigantic monitors on your desktop <laughs> because you are a badass you are not the average purchaser of a 13 inch MacBook so you think the average purchaser sure. is happier with the optical drive solution I think the average purchaser goes to buy a brand new installation of, you know, Adobe CS, whatever they're up to at this point, gets home, takes their $1,500 box of software, thunks it down on their desk, grabs the first DVD on the install and goes, uh-oh. <laughs> and then yes. they realize that they have to go spend, you know, $200 at the Apple store. And I, I pull that number out just to be obnoxious, but they have to go to the Apple store to buy the, <laughs> right. you know, milled External. aluminum billet style, you know, Apple Firewire compatible. 800 one. Yeah, rather than buying like a forty dollar external DVD drive from the from the you know the PC store down the down the way, they go to the Apple store to get the aesthetically pleasing DVD drive that allows them to transfer their new software purchases onto their <laughs> new notebook. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, I know. It, there's, right. I, th I think for a lot of people, and especially as much time as, as, as A, Steve has spent slagging the MacBook, and B, the fact that I think the MacBook Air is vaporizing in the wake of the iPad, I, I think a professional computer without an optical drive is a no-no over at Team Apple. 
Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much sums up. Do you have any other thoughts on the MacBook lineup, Patrick? I know you kind of mentioned it first that you did, or I'm sorry. Good to go. No, all right. <laughs> Uh, He's giving the thumbs up to some people in the audience. That are no, somebody, the podcast. somebody just wanted to was about to lock me into the building where I would have set off the alarm. So <laughs> I, <could've, laughs> I was like, "Thank you for not doing that." <laughs> well, let, let's move on quickly and talk about another kind of cooling based story. All this doesn't have anything to do with uh, performance. This is something that you did a little reading on, uh, and I think did you talk with uh, Kyle today? Actually. Yeah, uh, Kyle's uh, on the, the Techzilla episode that comes out on Thursday. Um, okay. I started looking at, so the my Core i7 system, my, my first like really, I usually build these $500 PCs, which are very trailing edge. They're affordable. They, they do everything I need them to do. They do basic gaming. Um, but for the first time in forever, I built a pretty badass PC a few months ago. And uh, I happened to have access to a, one of the old, remember the, uh, the HP Blackbird cases? That's oh, yeah. crazy. Extreme. Oh, you got one of those? I have two of them. <laughs> oh, that's not fair. That was that's left over from I, system, I right? A, I have a picture of me standing on that uh, yeah, when I did a review on it. I stood on the case just to show that it could hold, you know, two hundred pounds on top of it. In you know, case maybe you wanted to, people don't need that, but. It's it's like and it's they're they're amazing. They're also like they weigh like seventy five pounds. Like so, you want to like <laughs> put it where you want it and never move it again. Um, uh, which yeah. is like I was laughing because I had to bring it in from home to play around with this this uh, overclocking project. But so for this week's show, um, Kyle from Kyle Bennett from over at Hard OCP came on because I was realizing how inefficient the water cooling that's inside the Blackbird is. It wasn't too bad for the, the you know the 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 processor that was originally on there, um, mm -hmm. but the Core i seven and overclocking. I was realizing it doesn't seem to be holding up as well, and I started reading some of the the uh, uh, air cooling reviews on there, and it's amazing. A forty dollar air cooler, like code, the the code gauge, code gauge I, I have trouble saying code gauge for reasons uh, I will never figure out. Probably this code gauge True Spirit, or definitely the uh, the Thermalright uh, Ultra Extreme uh, one twenty, the the B and C or the latest versions. These yeah, fifty, you know, yeah, that's amazing. For, you know, fifty to seventy bucks if it's on, or like fifty bucks if it's on sale, seventy if it's not. And the code gauge, which sells for like forty bucks. Um, are probably delivering better cooling performance than the water cooling that's built into this crazy 400-pound case that I have. Um, and it's fantastic to realize how good air coolers have gotten over the last few years. Whoops. So what the, the uh, some of the, I guess the issue that you came up with was we found that some of these, I guess there were resellers of these fans or heat sinks were being sued. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I was all excited about like, cheap air coolers. You're like, yes, um, air coolers don't that, suck anymore. <laughs> Which is great. That's still good, but that's bigger less. news for the end user than um, the story we're about to cover. <laughs> well, it, it could be more of interest to the end user depending on how far this goes. Let me, let me. Uh, I, I somehow have managed to lose the story that I bury emailed the lead. to you. Um, yeah, bury the lead. Everybody needs a hobby. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> everybody needs a bad and dangerous hobby. Um, yeah, there's a company that basically it's claiming they have the right to uh, uh, all the heat pipes, all of, yeah, all heat pipe technology. At least if it's heat pipe technology being marketed by companies that are small enough to not have lawyers on retainer. <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly. This is where we would insert a super pipe joke that you wouldn't get because you're not a piece of perspective <laughs> contributor. Yeah, I haven't been following we'll the show as long, super but yes, later. Yeah, it's a company called American Technology, and uh, they're actually one of the first companies they're going after is FrozenCPU.com, uh, which is the uh, pretty good supplier, pretty uh, pretty cost effective. Basically, if you want to buy cheap overclocking parts, they're a good source. Yeah. Um, but they're going after Ultimate Computers, CoolerGuys.com, CPUtopia, FrontierPC.com, um, you know, and a whole bunch of others. Velocity Micro. Um, Man, I'm looking at this list. It's pretty crazy. Um, what they all have in common is they're basically being accused of U.S. patent 6,411,512 that is for a high-performance cold plate. Um, and the best part is that the defendants have been and still are infringing the 512 patent under yada, yada, yada by actively inducing direct infringement by end user who operate and or use cooling devices <laughs> and assemblies and embody or otherwise practice one of the more claims of the 512 patent, which I think... 
I am not a lawyer. I have friends who are lawyers. They read legal and then they can translate it. I read legal and then people make fun of me. But apparently that, that means everyone who's using a heat pipe, or a yes. heat pipe based uh, cooler that has not been approved or paid the fee uh, to, the, uh, to the folks at American Technology. Apparently we owe them a check or something like that. So the <laughs> Yeah, sometimes you get those $3 checks in the mail from a class action you didn't know about. This time you're going to get like a $3 bill. Yeah. <laughs> what, but it's, what, it's, I find, what I find kind of interesting about this is that they're not going after the manufacturers. They're going after no. the resellers. So they're going after Frozen PC, Frontier PC, Velocity Micro, those guys. They're not going after Thermal Take or Thermal Write or any of those types of companies that are actually manufacturing the heat yeah. sinks. Or even well, like people like Asus who do this on a huge scale. Well, here's here's the thing from a from a sort of strategic standpoint. There's two things I want to point out here. Is if you if you go up to the article and, and I'll forward you the link for that. Um, it's at, it's really it's at interesting. Yeah, the uh, the the high performance cold plate um, really doesn't. You know, I, I, you know if if you if you're creative, I think you could possibly confuse that with the heat pipes that are being used um, on uh, on PCs. Maybe I don't really see the resemblance, um, and, and I haven't spent enough time basically researching prior art. But part of what's really interesting strategically, we've seen this before in technology where a company decides it has the right to something. One of the more infamous, infamous examples is somebody decided that they had a patent that applied to all online transactions, which yeah. meant that anybody who was operating, they decided that anybody who was operating a store on the internet or and this is where the this is where the, the guy that owned the company at the time started salivating was that Every ATM transaction was covered by his patent. So his idea was <laughs> he found a whole bunch of profitable, small, profitable corporations that had a steady cash flow and didn't have lawyers on retainer, you know, or, or were small enough that you would assume that they didn't have a lawyer on retainer. And what you do is you go after those guys, 50,000 here, a quarter of a million there, maybe a million dollars, whatever the magic number is. You sue those people or more likely you threaten them and hope that they pay you cash. And then once you have enough cash built up in your war chest, then you go after bigger companies, right? So in this case, I think the idea is like, well, we're going we're gonna to go after these small, and this is complete conjecture on my part, so please don't sue me anyway. One, but the idea is that you go after the smaller companies, and then you know when you've got a bunch of money from suing these smaller companies, then you go after the big manufacturers that probably do have powerful legal teams on staff, and then you go after the really big companies. You know, um, you have money and you have precedent, which I'm told is very important in the legal world. Right? Yeah. So you would say, well, listen here, judge. In this case, all these other judges sided with us, so it's just one more kind of feather in the cap to get their way. And I'm sure that's precisely how they uh, couch it. Hey, listen here, judge. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have very good lawyers, I guess, but uh, well, they, they, they definitely do that hire legal. Me. I myself will be <laughs> Buying some, uh, a, a, my, I will be buying my my Thermorite 120 from Frozen CPU as, as my contribution to them fighting exactly. the good fight for my heat pipes, my beloved exactly. heat pipes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, buy your heat pipe uh, based air coolers now while you can. Stock <laughs> up, maybe. Uh, I don't. Th I, I honestly don't. Uh, well, I don't want to say I don't think it will actually work because I have so little faith in the legal system that we have that I think that this probably might go through. But um, I wouldn't be too worried about them stopping selling this. They'll, they'll continue to sell it some way or other. You notice Newegg is not on that, uh, that <laughs> suit case as well. And they, they sell more heat sinks than anybody, I would guess. So. And I don't need heat pipes for my Petra's Tech Shop water cooling system. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, you could use LN2. That, then you don't have Precisely. to worry about heat pipes Problem at all. solved. Any of that. Use, use the equivalent of car radiators and, and water. Easy What's wrong around. with that? <laughs> <laughs> now, we want to talk about a couple of smaller computing devices before we get to a couple of Twitter questions uh, for this week. One of them is, when we started, when Patrick and I started throwing ideas back and forth about what to talk about this week, it was the iPhone 4 rumor that in the span between then and today became the iPhone 4 unveiling and the iPhone 4 dissection and the, the yeah, phone that was in the lawsuits, bathroom that was stolen. The oh, yeah. Uh, I like so the letter from the lawyer at Apple. Oops, sorry, go ahead, Kelly. <laughs> I like the letter from the lawyer at Apple. Did you read that one? Yes. <laughs> Let me know where to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get right on that. 
here's all the you put all the pieces in a bag maybe <laughs> give them back <laughs> to them. that would be pretty funny apart. I Actually, video feel really that. bad for the you know for them kind of deciding to tell the entire world who this poor guy that lost the iPhone is. Although the, that's a lot of the conjecture and by a lot of bloggers is that you know is was this stolen? Was it really stolen? Was it you know uh, was it I lost? I guess that's why was they it, did that. Oh, <laughs> poor little prototype iPhone. <laughs> for the people who are listening right now, we're showing the pictures of it in many many pieces. The dissection, so to speak. Yeah, I thought that whole part about them kind of calling that guy out seemed kind of weird. But I guess you're right, Patrick. It does kind of make sense that uh, a lot of people were saying that this was all staged by Apple or, you know, something like that. But this was how Gizmodo wanted to prove that it wasn't set up by here's this poor guy that's probably going to get fired now. <laughs> uh, at the very, probably he'd be lucky to just get fired and sent on his way at this point. Um, we will never but, hear from him again. Yeah. What, what was wasn't there a worker in Shenzhen, China that like lost there are and suicides? And, for that. <laughs> oh, okay. He, they weren't yeah. they weren't killed. They just killed themselves when well, they lost had, an iPhone they, prototype. Yeah, I think he had gone through several days of being pointedly questioned uh, by the security team at the organization about what was going on, and and just kind of lost it. Um, Either that, way, was actually, it was very intense and bad. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, to say the least. So, what do we? What did we learn about the iPhone four? A lot of people are calling it four G, which I I kind of want people Fourth to not generation. Do. Right. So, like four point iPhone four, whatever. It's not four G. It's not going to be as awesome and fast as the HTC four G phone that'll be out on Sprint. Well, but, we we have no idea what the what the processor speed is in the iPhone four yes. So it it could be awesomely fast. We just don't. We, just, we <laughs> yeah, have no idea what they're gigabyte. running for a processor inside of there. I, I would um, assume that they're using some variable or very uh, variant of the A four, maybe a little bit lower clocked because of the smaller battery and all that kind of stuff. That the same processor that they're using in uh, the iPad. If mm -hmm. so, that's going to be an improvement. Although how it compares to like the one gigahertz Snapdragon that's coming out on all these Android phones in the second half <laughs> of this year, I'd be curious. You know, but be interesting to see how that kind of compares. I also thought I read somewhere that they were that the drive, the hard drive was like an eighty gig had like eighty gigs of storage. Did they clarify that in the uh, that's dissection? That's what I keep at reading. All? Yeah, just I'm not sure number. where they how they decided to calculate that if they were counting memory chips or. What? Um, I mean, on the back, it just says XX uh, gigabytes, which, of yeah. course, doesn't mean anything. But I think that at one point, it was booting on a limited scale. Well, the, the, for apparently, the first person that found it, it was working. He was playing with it. He could tell it was using I, uh, iPhone OS 4.0, or he's using an OS that he hadn't seen before. Uh, but by the time Gizmodo got it, it had been bricked, obviously, and wouldn't turn on, wouldn't boot, wouldn't sync, do anything like that. So they didn't get a whole lot. They couldn't get any software information out of it, which I'm sure was a little bit of a letdown for their five thousand dollar investment. But you know, I think they I th got plenty for their five thousand dollars. I think last investment. time I checked, they were at two point five million unique viewers on that article. Would you pay five grand for that for PCPer.com? <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> and to be permanently on Steve Jobs' um, bad list. Um, to me, that's worth it because I was never planning on being on his good list. So. <laughs> okay. I, I still think that was worth it. Now, does the idea of a front-facing camera scare you or excite you? I, I think they need it to be competitive at this point. Um, the iPhone, you know, <laughs> as an iPhone user, um, I can say it definitely needs a better main camera. A flash is a good idea. Yes. The front-facing camera. Everybody wants, like, that's a lot of people were, were, were unhappy about the iPod not having... Uh, you know, a front facing or, you know, I, 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 I don't particularly miss having a, a, a regular camera on the iPad, but having a front facing camera would have been nice because it would have made it a really useful mm -hmm. video conferencing tool. Um, and that's, I, I, I don't think at this point with Android that and I, I could be horribly wrong or Steve could decide that we don't need a front facing camera. Um, but I think a front facing camera is kind of necessary because people want video conferencing or they want to do their quick video stream or they want to be able to record video of themselves talking or over their friends and stuff and not just have to sort of look at the shiny reflection and the little tiny camera on the, on the back right. to do that. I think it's kind of de, de for the smartphone technology at this point. 
Agreed. Um, I mean, I think it's going to be exciting. The, the whole question is, how are they going to be able to do it from a network perspective? I mean, if, the, if you really are having a Skype video conversation that way, um, that opens up a lot of questions for AT&T and bandwidth and uh, upstream bandwidth. Yeah. One of the things that I actually found, um, I've done a lot of testing of 3G and 4G wireless providers, and I've found that the fastest upload speed I've ever been able to get is from AT&T, but that mm -hmm. was downhill with a tailwind on a good day. The majority <laughs> of the time, it's not like that. So, right. um, you know, I'd, I question whether or not we're, uh, we're going to be seeing video conferencing. Well, didn't, I mean, Steve Jobs showed and specifically mentioned Skype in the iPhone OS 4.0, like, reveal last, this but month, right? But is it Skype video? Do we know that? Well, uh, man, don't that's an interesting thought. I, 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 I think at this point, um, I think at this point, uh, you know, AT and T's rolling out 850 megahertz nationwide by the end of this year. Because I think if they don't, they're in deep trouble. I think they're going to keep upgrading their network. I hope. Uh, it, you know, if if I plan on keeping on using an iPhone, I got to say, I mean, I was I was at uh, CTIA when Sprint uh, unveiled the uh, HTC Evo, the 4G phone, and mm -hmm. that really had me thinking like. You know, I really like my Sprint modem. <laughs> or I should say my right. Sprint a USB thumb drive. My overdrive is is having charging oh, yeah. fits, but that's a whole other conversation. Oh, um, yeah, no, I, I like mine too. In fact, I keep it in my pocket all day long, just in case. <laughs> but the the HD2, that 480 by that huge screen oh. processor, the Snapdragon processor, oh. and, and that's a really scary noise when you do that, Kali. So hot. <laughs> oh, I'm drooling. <laughs> the uh, the uh, you know I, I think Apple at this point really needs to step it up if they're going to kind of keep the market share and the mindset for the iPhone because um, the iPhone I think the iPhone still does a better job of integrating most of your basic phone usage compared to the Android platforms yes. um, but I mean, you know I also I'm... laugh because you know Steve Jobs is spending so much time being like Android is the platform for people that want to download porn it's a porn phone it's not a serious <laughs> phone like an iPhone you know all you could be doing is talking me into it more <laughs> that's between you and your phone Colleen <laughs> um, uh, you know speaking of something else that's kind of in a competition here with Apple we talked about the iPad I do want to mention I had my first iPad overheating experience yesterday I was sitting really? on my manage that? I was sitting on the deck and I was watching twit live through the twit pad app and all of a sudden it clicks off and it says your iPad is overheating. Please wait 30 minutes and try again type of wow. thing. And I was like, oh, all right. I guess I'll go sit in the shade instead of in the sun. It didn't, I mean, and I felt the back of it. It wasn't like hot. I mean, it was warm. Was it, it plugged you know, in and they, charging at the time or was it just no, the battery not, drain? No, it was just, it was just, just uh, using just the battery. Just stick so. in the refrigerator for a while. <laughs> That's that condensation thing again, Colleen. Oops. <laughs> Um, but but uh, competition to that, uh, there are a couple ones. Um, we wanted to mention the HP Slate. I don't think we'd ever talked about that on this show before. And it's not out yet. People are saying uh, in May or late May, I think, we might actually start to see this. Is now, this anyone on this show excited about it? I'm a little less excited about the Slate than I am about the Dell tablets, but I'm really curious to see. I'm, I'm a little less excited about the Slate now that I know it's got a, a 1.6 gigahertz Atom yeah. processor. I yeah. was hoping yeah. to have a more mobile-oriented processor. Um, battery life. Yeah, the battery life. I mean, the really funny thing about the iPad is part of the reason it's got 10 hours of battery life is because they basically, it's it's a little tiny chunk of motherboard. It's basically an iPod touch motherboard, you know, literally about size wise right. and two huge batteries. That's why the whole, the back of the iPad arcs to give them room for more of those batteries inside of there. Um, and Which is a great I'm design just, choice. Well, yeah, but it's like with the slate, you're looking at five hours. And yes. for me, you know, HP's, you know, the thing with HP is like they're into verticals. They sell into insurance companies and hospitals. They're HP. They're a big, powerful, you know, corporate. Uh, they, 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 you know, they sell a lot of, they sell a lot of computers into verticals. So, you know, right. maybe it's more for that. But five hours on a, on a device like the, the iPad on a tablet like that, a personal use tablet, I think is going to be short. I think you need, you know, I think you need a full day's usage out of it, or at least I would want a full day's usage out of it. I completely agree. I think that's an entire deal breaker. I don't think, unless I, if it's, if I'm carrying a tablet with me, it has to work 
all day, anytime, and it has to be instant on. I, yep. I don't want to have to shut it down and boot it back up or hibernate it or whatever. <laughs> I think the, the iPad um, has a really good balance in that perspective. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. I, I, I think a lot of people kind of, you know, I, 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 when I put my laptops, you know, they don't hibernate. They just go into suspend. So it wakes up pretty quick. But there's, I mean, there's a, you know, there's a big difference between a one second turn on time quote on the iPad versus a 10 or 15 second one on your laptop when you're just trying to check the weather before you head out or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think so, tablets uh, are all about instant gratification. Well, they're, they're appliances more so than they're not, they're, they're not computers, they're appliances. And we expect our appliances to be instantaneous, at least up until Blu-ray players where we pretend they're going to be instantaneous and we sit and stare at the black screen doing the HDMI oh switch my. of Doom while we're waiting for the, the Blu-ray disc to boot up. <laughs> not, I not remember I had, the, bitter. <laughs> I had the first HD DVD player from Toshiba and I would uh, turn it on and then go make popcorn or something like that. <laughs> before it would get to the screen where you could even open the tray to put a disc in. Yeah, uh, and it was, it was, it was basically that the, the first HD DVD players were essentially Linux PCs um, disguised as, uh, as, as Blu-ray. Yes. Well, they, they, were, they, 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 they certainly did play AC DVDs, but they were definitely full-on gnarly Linux PCs inside of a, a DVD player case, a very big DVD player case. It was definitely an early adopter technology. Now, the Dell tablets you mentioned before, those are kind of what people are used to seeing, traditional convertible tablets, you know, where well, it's the, got a the keyboard. The ones I'm thinking of is, is Dell's no, nah, I'm thinking of the ones that they've they've been they've been doing a cell phone overseas and and there's been a lot of rumors around a five inch um Android. To, mm. excuse me? And it's an Android play that they're doing, right? I, I believe so. The, the one of the articles I was reading was basically saying that, like it's a five inch, and then later on five inch with three G, a Snapdragon processor, um, similar to the the HTC uh, uh, okay. the Sprint HTC phone, and then coming out later on with a seven inch and then a ten inch uh, version of that. So that that one, I think, you know, in terms of like Snapdragon and Android, I think it's going to be a much closer comparison to the, the basically a consumer device like the iPad or consumer oriented device like the iPad. Gotcha. I see. Called the uh, uh, Mini Five is the name of it. And the yeah. you know, the iPad or, sorry, or the, the Streak uh, is the other one yeah, I've heard. <laughs> but oh, that's so gross. The um, <laughs> the HP product is going to be running a customized version of Windows 7, so all the applications that you're going to be getting and running are not necessarily going to be designed for your fat finger and instant gratification. Right. It's going to be a very complicated interface, and I think that it's not necessarily going to suit itself to a uh, tablet situation. I mean, right now, upstairs, I have a Windows 7 Dell convertible notebook, and it's great for what it is. It's a computer that I can use standing up, but it mm -hmm. does not give me the instant gratification experience that's making the iPad a compelling consumer device. Well, and that's also the trade-off, right? Everybody's like, "Well, Apple won't open up the iPad, and I can't." Like for me, I'm you know, I, I spent the you know, I spent all my free time for like a week trying to figure out how to get GPS functionality into the iPad because I want to use it as a navigational tool. Because you know, mm. full size nine inch, ten inch GPS is dedicated GPS is cost a lot more than an iPad. Um, but, you know, that, that's kind of the trade-off, right? You have a closed platform and Steve can beat on people with a stick and make everything magic and there's this complete integrated interface and there's style and there's savoir-faire or whatever you want to say. I can use words like Walt Mossberg and say, luminous presentation of a full multi-touching <laughs> computing environment, right? Get all sophisticated. Um, and that's the trade-off, right? You're going to run Windows 7. You know, the trade-off is like Windows 7. It's Windows 7. You I don't can think run that's the trade-off. Windows 7. What about What's the Android? But you see, you understand that if you go with Android is, is I already said before, Android is basically going the iPad route. It's going for a, a, an right. appliance operating system, which means you don't have all of the applications you're familiar with on Windows. HP's decision is we're going to use Windows 7, right, which is it's familiar and there's a lot of applications out there, right. which is partially, partially also why I think maybe they're leaning towards this is something that's going to go into verticals for them. You know, people that are running around doing, you know, insurance investigations where it's like they're filling out paperwork on a tablet and they're taking pictures of the damage to the car after the accident and they hit some buttons right. and it zips up to the mothership. Um, who knows? It'll be, it'll be interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see how either one feels. You know, can I, they I, get I agree. I mean, I, I agree with exactly what you're saying because it's one of the things that frustrates me about the iPad is everybody, everybody's falling in love with the iPad. But in reality, 
I don't feel like Apple really did it. The people, the reason people love the iPad is not because of anything Apple did. It's because of the applications that are on the iPad. And most of those applications the come from third nice party too. developers. The hard, I mean, the hardware is nice, but I mean, they didn't do anything revolutionary that changed from the iPhone to this. What people like is the iPad software that you get. And what's kind of disappointing to me as a fan of, I don't want to say a fan of Windows, but a fan of PC and this kind of open design architecture, architecture is that all of that software that's on the iPad could run on the, uh, the HP slate. Well, all that software could have could have been developed for it. You could have had like the Marvel application that everybody loves in the iPad. There's no well, reason that application could have existed on current tablets. There, there actually is a reason why it, it kind of can't exist on current tablets. It's because the multi-touch in current... I've, I've played around a bunch with the multi-touch in Windows 7. And while it's a lot better than in Vista or XP, it is, it's yeah. still not as... It's not nearly as seamless and, and intuitive. Or, or maybe it's, it's not as seamless and has been ingrained into us the way that the iPhone did it. Because the iPhone, the iPhone is this kind of the secret weapon to, for, for the iPad, right? Because you've got millions of people who understand, like, I'm going to go like this, I'm going to do this, I do that. I poke, I touch, right. and you know. And it is much as I like to say that the iPad is a big iPod Touch because, in a lot of ways, it is. They also change the way a lot of the basic applications function, so that it really takes advantage of the additional screen real estate. And I think that's just going to continue to extend in the iPhone 4.0. And because they're Apple, and because they have this cachet within the community, then they can go to Marvel, Marvel, <laughs> Marvel, and say, <laughs> "We're going to release our new widget." We want, you know, it's, look, it's the size of a comic book, you know, we right. want to have comic books on this. So we're going right. to see you. I, I agree. I agree with that. I just, I, I feel like if somebody from the Windows environment had said, hey, because, I, you know, the multi-touch problems might be part Windows 7. It's part hardware implementation as well. You know, I, I've used some, some multi-touch screens that are okay, but you're right. None as good as what you get on the iPad in terms of responsiveness and speed and that kind of stuff. I just feel like. It's those software environments that control everything. And that, that most yeah. of the stuff that I'm doing on my iPad could be done on a slate or on on a convertible yeah. Lenovo X201 had somebody had the foresight to develop that in software. Well, I think part of it. Is. Oops, sir. Go ahead, Colleen. Yeah, no, no. I think that you're both right to a certain extent. I mean, uh, you know, Patrick, earlier you were talking about the closed down nature of it. And now you're talking about the way that, you know, the, the paradigm of the applications and the hardware. And I think, you know, Android is sort of the it allows you to be open and do things like, you know, adding GPS right. and it also runs on a um, ARM processor so you can have much lower battery consumption. It's designed to be a touch interface all the time. So I think that's kind of the mixture between the two of the openness we're looking for as geeks, mm -hmm. which right. maybe not everyone is looking for and runs, <laughs> allows you to create hardware and software solutions that are what we want. We all are kind of in agreement that Windows is Windows 7 is not really what we want out of our tablet. Yeah. And, and to, to, to kind of talk about what you're saying before is part of the problem with, with, with touch screens and tablets on the PC side is there's been these epic stories of attempts and failures to bring, you yes, know, it's like, you know, like, like Microsoft, you know, Bill Gates broke his teeth several times, you know, millions of dollars in acquisitions, failed projects. We announced the next super thing. Nobody adopts Project it. Project Origami. Something. You know, there's, but they've, they've been like, they've been doing literally like a decade, you know, this has been going on for a long time in the Windows platform. And at this so point, hard. Well, it's like 3D glasses for gaming, right? It's like every two or three years, somebody finds another five cartons of, you know, like container ship cartons, you know, like, you know, another five containers of 3D glasses. They update the driver software and they release them again. Now, finally, the, you know, the last generation of NVIDIA stuff actually kind of looks 3D and it's immersive and it doesn't make me want to vomit as soon as like the ship turns a corner in the video. <laughs> Um, but it's kind of really funny. Like it's one of those things where, like, every three years, oh, look, 3D gaming is here, and you get a call from really enthusiastic PR people, and the 3D revolution <laughs> has arrived. And I've gotten that, I've gotten that call like in '97, 2000, 2003. You know what yeah. I mean? Like every few years, it keeps coming back. But with the Android, the, the thing that's holding Android back right now, despite the fact that they have Google behind them, which is this huge, talented, wealthy organization, you know, they got money to throw at projects like this, is the adoption. You know, the iPhone is, you know, it's, there's nowhere near as many Blackberries in the market as iPhones, but there are millions and millions and millions of iPhone users. And because of that, it creates this instant market that attracts a lot of developer talent. And Android just does not have the market penetration that, that, uh, that I, the 
iPhone does on the consumer side. If, currently. If they, currently, yeah. You know, I, I think part of the reason, you know, there's been so much slagging of Android uh, at certain levels of Apple is because they're in the beginning of really taking Android seriously as a competitor. That's, I mean, that's going to be fun to watch, and I think it's going to be really good for consumers. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, Apple versus Google fighting to create the most perfect mobile operating system the available. Of the Titans. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, but that's just, I, I don't see any downside for consumers in that situation. No. No, this is, uh, this is great. This is, um, they're going to go nuclear soon, and we're just going to get awesome phones and tablets from it. But, um, I hope. Yeah. It would be nice. <laughs> All right, uh, let's. Uh, we've got a couple of a handful of Twitter questions, I guess that we'll that we'll run through here. I asked a little bit late. I think people may, people maybe weren't expecting to get a request for questions on a Tuesday. We usually do the show on Wednesdays, but I think we got a few worth getting into here. If you want to uh, switch back and forth there with me, uh, Patrick, and uh, take this first one if you want. Sure. Uh, this is for at Ryan Shroud from at Tim Shadler. Question for Twitch. ATI 58 at $300 or GTX 470 at $350? What's got the better bang for the buck in regards to DX10 and DX11 gaming? Well, uh, we, we kind of were talking about this in the pre-show, I guess. And Which nobody listening right now for the most part heard. Right, right. But... What we're what we're thinking here is the in, in my opinion the GTX 470, which is the new Nvidia the, their first DX11 part, performs better than the 5850 uh, in most cases, and in some cases it can perform almost as well as the Radeon HD 5870, mm -hmm. which is the step above the 5850 that he mentioned in, in his question. Um, so. With a $50 price difference, it really comes down to how valuable that $50 is. Um, it, the 5850 is going to run a lot cooler. It's going to run maybe quieter as well. It uses less power. Uh, most of the time for gamers, that's not really what they're concerned about. <laughs> so if, if that's not an issue, I'm, you know, I, I'm almost leaning towards a GTX 470, except for mm -hmm. one thing. One thing always pulls me back to the AMD side, and that's, Ifinity and support for three displays on a single graphics card it always kind of makes me feel good hearing that and, and being able to do that on, on, on your system. If you don't mind fish eyeing. Well, even, I mean, even if you're not doing gaming on it, just having three displays. You can have three displays on a... Uh, oh, I guess, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> no, no, I, I see where you're going with that. I'm like, you could have three yeah. displays on an NVIDIA system. Oh, from a single card. Yeah, that's pretty compelling. Right. <laughs> I completely yeah. agree with you on that. And yeah. you're right. But if you have NVIDIA, you got CUDA, and if you're doing a lot of encoding, then it can be an advantage on that side a little bit. I gotta, I gotta say, you. a lot of the benchmarks, man, they, they seem to be really close, like, you know, three to five frames per second on a 30, 50 frame, you know what I mean? 30, 40 frames right. per second, and if you're looking at a three to five frame difference, I don't know how much of that you're going to notice in real life. They're both yeah, really nice if cards. It's that small, in those instances where it's that small, probably not at all. So... You know, take take a look at some reviews uh, and see you know exactly maybe which games you're focusing on if there's if there's noticeable performance differences and then look at that features. You know, Patrick said you get CUDA acceleration on one uh, on the Nvidia side. You don't get that on AMD side. You kind of have to wait for when OpenCL gets integrated and some of these other applications. But you get Ifinity and, and support for that kind of stuff as you well. You get so. physics on Nvidia in case you play Mirror's Edge and only Mirror's Edge. <laughs> Or Batman. So Mirror's Batman Edge is, is a critical application. Dude, Mirror's <laughs> Edge is awesome. I just don't know if PhysX is compelling in any other way other than that. I, it's, I good think on, it's good on Batman. But that's <laughs> There's two games. That's two more games than I ever thought would have been <laughs> worth playing. <laughs> Like phys every time, like physics seemed like it'd be doing something really good. Like there was another leap in processor performance, and uh, yeah. it, it's tough to be physics. <laughs> we got All another right, one uh, from Lose. Oops, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, loser at loser. Yeah, I'm brazenly assuming that L U Z three R is loser. Asks when overclocking a CPU. Let's say, for example, maybe he's got a friend with a uh, 6600 running at 3.5 uh, gigahertz, or maybe a Core i7 860 at 4.0 gigahertz. How does it affect its lifespan? And does lapping make it? And then we. I think lost it said worse. It said, worse. does lapping make it worse? In theory, lapping should make it better, right? Because you sit there and you have your like multi-thousand grit 
uh, your sheet of glass and your like 15,000 zillion grit abrasive and you're smoothing it. The idea of lapping, right, is you make the top of the processor and the bottom of the cooler as smooth as possible so that you will have the most perfect connection using the most minimal amount of thermal compound possible. So I don't think lapping, you know, unless you basically, you know, go out and find a grinder and press the processor against it and grind away <laughs> the entire metal towel. You know, there's the metals on top of the processor to conduct things. And right? I see no way that could go wrong. None. <laughs> so you know somebody out there has done it, you know. I don't uh, know that person. She's she would be insane. <laughs> There's sounds like an expensive mistake for whoever made that, whoever she might have been. The uh, so I don't think lapping, as long as you don't actually grind the processor down to the point where you expose the the chips inside, I don't think lapping is going to make it worse. I've you know I've never actually had a processor wear out. <laughs> Chips kind of last forever if they're if the, the cooling's proper and with thermal right. shutdowns, um, it's you know you have to really work hard to, you know, without introducing moisture into the equation, you know, or or you know beer or soda or you know stream vibrations, stream vibrations like letting it rattle around in the back of your truck or trophy uh, truck in the Baja Nine Thousand. <laughs> that, that that can be awkward. The uh, awkward. <laughs> When you actually separate the heat sink off of a piece of electronics in a vehicle that's bouncing. Um, but it really, outside of like um, not having a surge protector on it, um, having a really, 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 really bad power supply, uh, lightning strike and not having a surge protector or, you know, physical damage, uh, you know, by, you know, shorting it out with a bunch of water. It's really hard to kill a processor. And the way the processors are designed now, thankfully, I think I think I had a personal part in in bringing on thermal shutdowns on <laughs> processors <laughs> that I, I won't discuss at the moment. But basically, Intel and AMD were kind of embarrassed at the fact that you could fry a processor. So they decided that, you know, it got expensive when, when let's say, their OEMs maybe had a little issue with thermal paste or their or their or their you know, heat sink wasn't functioning as well it should be, or the fan stopped and the heat sink and then the processor would basically flame out. What they basically, they, they put a sensor inside, it monitors the temperature, the thermals get to a certain point. And on the Core i7, for example, uh, instead of just automatically panicking and shutting it down, it slows down the core speed until the thermals get to an appropriate level, which is 100 degrees, less than 100 degrees Celsius on the Core i7 that I've got. Um, and if, if it doesn't cool off, then they shut it down completely. It's really, really hard to kill a processor loser uh, if you set it up properly, if you don't spill water on it, if you don't, you know, pour liquid nitrogen on it. Um. <laughs> I've never yeah, killed that a would processor. Be bad as well. I've killed uh, graphics cards, but that's an entire circuit board of things for me to destroy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the question of uh, does overclocking affect the lifespan of the silicon itself? And I think definitively the answer is yes, but you're talking about taking it from like 100 years to 20 years. So <laughs> does that affect you, you in your at that point. upgrade cycle, right? You know, and, and so I think there's truth that running it at a higher voltage than it's spec will lower its lifespan. It's a matter of whether or not that it's not going to lower it to six months or anything like that unless right. you electrically fry it or something like that, like Patrick was just describing. So <laughs> I think I think overclocking is safe as long as your temperatures are safe. So. Just don't worry about it. That's not something you need to be concerned with. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. We have time for another question or Yeah, let's let's do one more. Uh, X Jake says, is there a program that will work like on live only over the land for PC gaming? Oh, he wants to play games on a desktop via a notebook. X Jake it's never going to work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it'll work, just not well. Well, yeah, if, 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 you know what I mean, if you're in physics land where there's no friction and electrons travel at the speed of light, which they don't, and your network travel, it's just, you know, you're going to sit there and you're going to be like, D, you're going you're, you're gonna to turn and then it's going to go over the network and then eventually the control on the computer will turn and by that time you've been shot by everybody else. So you're trying to tell me you're not a supporter stuff. of the on live service, Patrick? Uh, you're not a big proponent? All the way you back know, there in the camera shot. <laughs> Perhaps I have I've I've I will I will go out and try on live and email you whether or not it's successful for me. I just I just don't see a lot of I just don't see anybody homebrewing a notebook connection because like basically it's like I want to sit in the for VNC room. for gaming. Yeah, and it's like it doesn't tend to work very well. VNC or maybe sucks on a regular GUI that's not refreshing <laughs> yeah, the entire screen every second or every frame. Yeah. 
I mean, you might be able to get away playing like StarCraft and some of those types of non-Twitch-based games. Turn over, by turn over games. Like that. Bejeweled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Scrabble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, well, but anything I mean, it's like not, really it's not technically it's not technically impossible. Somebody could write a program for this. I mean, right now we are producing this entire um, show on an audio system from Axia, which has a two millisecond delay from um, when we digitize a audio packet into a uh, or an audio input into a packet and send it to a destination on the other side of the system. Um, mm -hmm. So you could theoretically using UDP technology and having really small packets and doing a really good job of developing the entire network and using expensive Cisco sure. switches. It's possible. If you're asking, again, you're not actually doing it and you won't be able to and it's not worth your time. For today, the answer is no, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, for, for, you know, next year, maybe on live, we'll have figured this out. Now, it's not exactly doing what he wants it to do, where he can have a desktop upstairs right. and be downstairs watching TV and play a game on his notebook. Uh, but in theory, you'd be able to play that game on the notebook anyway. So I, I don't know. I mean, if anybody listening knows of anything that's maybe used for that, you I'd know, be, a I'd higher be really speed curious. Version, I'd be, I'd, we'd love to hear it. And you know we could try it out and tell you about it next week, but uh, as far as I know, there's nothing. There's nothing to do that. You know, look at VNC software and maybe Google VNC for gaming and see what you come up with. My answer, my my theory would be you get a bunch of don't try it kind of <laughs> your Google results, but I don't know. So, Sorry, I'm like sitting here like pre-registering for on live because it comes out PC Mac via browser plugin June 17, 2010. Yeah. I signed up for that. I signed up for that as well. We'll see if they draw, if they, uh, if they pick me. We, I don't I have think a, they like have, you very much, Ryan. I have a, I have a sort me, of history, Patrick. We'll go, we can go into later. With, with <laughs> on, but uh, I don't, I'm not sure they're going to they're gonna let me go. But hey, when they start selling to actual customers, surely they'll let me in then. So, All right. Well, that, uh, that's all of our show for this week. I do want to thank you, uh, Patrick, for joining us. I think it was oh, a good my pleasure, mix. Man. A lot of fun talking about breaking hardware and you know <laughs> trying not to get condensation and frost on your motherboard topics that I think interest everybody and hopefully will affect everybody. <laughs> yeah, that'll be lost everybody in the first five minutes, in which case I'd like to apologize. <laughs> you know, I, one of the things I guess I should say is, you know, Colleen made the, made the comments like seeing the smoke from these types of things is really what kind of makes it exciting around these computers. If you, uh, if you go to PCPer.com and you look up uh, a video that we posted called the, uh, it's from the ASUS OC Summit. And you got, we, we have a video there where we show some of these guys playing with this LN2 liquid nitrogen overclocking and, you know, the setup process that they go through. And then we, I think we even show some of the submersion, you know, with the motherboard laying in puddles of, of uh, mineral oil and that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in seeing it, because maybe just listening to it wasn't very exciting, I can understand that. Uh, check out that video or there are lots of videos of that kind of stuff online as well. Um, so... Yeah, and also thanks to Colleen for, for joining us once again. Also another interesting perspective on that type of stuff. You can, if you want to ask Colleen about what other things she's grinded to, to their own demise. Uh, we can <laughs> it survived, I swear. <laughs> I have more trouble actually not with processors, but with um, the, um, the sockets on like socket 775 and LJ1356 um, motherboards yeah. where the pins are on the motherboard, not on the CPU. And they've got right. these little weird angles, and if you bend them, you can't really fix them. Those, yeah, those are the bane of my existence. Uh, really so, Patrick, where can, we find, where can they find you at? Uh, techzilla.com, T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A.com. And uh, actually, we've got Veronica Belmont on the show. She's got a review of the new Veronica MacBooks. Who? Veronica Belmont, the legendary Veronica Belmont, uh, <laughs> who's apparently in a, a uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to talk about it. John said something obnoxious about her and, and, and mayhem may actually ensue. But uh, <laughs> the legendary nurse hat, where is that picture? The, uh, uh, and some follow up, we're talking with uh, Kyle Bennett from Hard OCP about what's going on with air coolers. And uh, it's amazing how good cheap air coolers have gotten. Very cool. Check that out. I was excited. <laughs> All right, Colleen, you are on Twitter. Twitter.com slash Digital Kitty. Digital Kitty. Digital Kitty. And you can find me on Twitter at Ryan Shrout. Patrick, you are at Patrick Norton, correct? I am. Okay. And uh, also you can find me at PCPer.com, which is where we write about all the good hardware 
and the not so good hardware, I guess, as well. Uh, so if you want reviews and videos and that kind of stuff, check out PCPer.com. So uh, everybody, thank you for listening. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us and we'll see you next week.